Welcome to JMW's Inside Man YouTube channel. I've got three guests today. Patrick Boyers is a solicitor within JMW's commercial road transport team. And David Roberts and Luke Mitchell of Connect Corporate Finance. So, Patrick, if I can speak to you first of all, what sort of things do operators need to consider in a post-Brexit world? Well, Dom, it largely depends on the, the type of goods that are being moved. If you are a third party haulage operator, then you're obviously going to be carrying other people's goods and moving them from, from the UK or the Great Britain to wherever. And in those circumstances, you need to make sure that you're in constant contact with both your sellers and the buyers on the other end, because ultimately you need various different pieces of information from them to navigate the different border operating models and to ensure that you, you don't get stuck on a coast by uh, some various different uh, form of border force. In addition to that, there's also a variety of different procedures and processes called transit. So you've got CTC, you've got the old TIR carnets, and you've also got the ATA carnets. If you're running your goods under one of these various different types of procedures, it's absolutely imperative, absolutely imperative that you know properly where you need to go and what you need to do in order to ensure that the procedures are adhered to. Because if in a duty suspension procedure, such as the, those different transit methods, you don't tick a box or you don't get the procedure right, then all of a sudden duty can become payable. And it, it's always a bit of an argument about who and how that duty gets paid. Uh, that's obviously if you're a third party operator, if you're moving your own goods through your own operator's license, you're obviously going to want to uh, make sure that you know what types of goods you're moving and the different customs requirements that come with that. Um, and then lastly, I think the only remaining key point, well, there are plenty of key points I could go on for ages, but one of the most recent things is uh, there was a recent high court case that uh, looked at the CMR convention and which is wholly as liability uh, to goods uh, if they are lost or damaged in transit. And uh, long and short of it is that there, there is a limitation on wholly as liability under the CMR, under the CMR convention um, unless there is willful neglect on the part of the haulier. And so those are some of the key points that we, we, we're highlighting to, to haulage operators in, respect, in a post-Brexit world. And Luke, I always think that while there are cranes in the city, uh, buildings are getting built and construction is all good. I see lots of HGVs on the road as well. What are conditions like in the uh, freight forwarding and haulage industry at the moment? Yeah, Dominic, I, I would say it's been a, a, a tricky year for many operating across the entirety of the, the supply chain, looking at freight forwarders and tra transport companies there's soaring overheads uh, escalated by fuel rises. You've got wage increases in there as well. And I guess those companies have had to try and navigate these cost challenges. Arguably, it's been the toughest year for asset heavy businesses. So those hauliers, um, obvious reasons is that these assets need to be maintained regardless of the market conditions. Um, they've also got to deal with HGV driver shortages uh, impacting the operations drastically. Um, but in addition to, to those skilled drivers, you've also got warehouse staff, logistics managers at a shortage, and something definitely needs to happen in terms of upskilling uh, up those professionals. Um, I guess many have tried to navigate those labor shortages and, and cost challenges whilst maintaining competitive pricing. But as we all know, it's very difficult in an industry which already has very low margins. Um, and I guess the knock on effect of that, Dominic, unfortunately, has been that there has been a record number of hauliers that have been made insolvent in the last year and a direct fallout of the what I've mentioned above, but also, I guess, the, the state of the economy at the moment as well. Um, so there's actually been double the number of insolvencies in, in haulage this year. And I guess working out those unsustainable margins with the increased overheads, it's unsurprising to see that, that many hauliers have, have struggled for sure. And are you seeing many cross-border M&A deals in the sector? Yes, for sure, Adam. Great question. A, a lot of the work that we do here at Connect is helping acquisitive logistics providers across, uh, operating across the entirety of the, the supply chain 
uh, with their acquisition strategy. And typically this is working with European logistics providers, um, North American logistics providers, helping them find uh, businesses to acquire in, in the UK. And there continues to be appetite uh, for those types of businesses specifically within haulage as well. Um, a couple of the deals just to mention that we've seen this year uh, within the sector, one would be Belgium headquartered food logistics specialist Citra Group acquiring Abbey Logistics. Um, another one, a large player over in Europe, a Danish headquartered DFDS acquired McBurney Transport in Northern Ireland. So there definitely continues to be uh, that interest from European buyers within the haulage sector. And Patrick, for businesses acquiring other businesses in the sector, what sort of things should they consider from a regulatory point of view? Yeah, there's a there's a whole host of considerations. Uh, the one of the primary ones is if you're buying a business that already holds an operator's license, um, how does the deal need to be structured in order to preserve that license? Is the target being purchased out of a license holding company group so if it's just a specified subsidiary is there going to need to be a new license application luke obviously mentioned the the significant interest of european hauliers in the uk haulage market uh, and one of the reasons it's so attractive to have a uk based company with uh, a traffic commissioner issued operator's license is that it, it, it makes it easier to navigate something called cabotage rules and regulations which is all about the number of journeys and restrictions on, uh, on what international operators can do when they come into the UK. And so actually structuring the deal and making sure that, that the purchaser and the, the, the seller get, get what they need out of, out of a deal is, is obviously a very important consideration. Second to that, it's all about the relationship with the traffic commissioner. If as a consequence of some kind of transaction or a purchase or an acquisition, the board of a, of an, of a license holding company is significantly changed or if there's a material change in the business, there's obviously, got, there's obviously going to need to be consideration on whether the traffic commissioner needs to be notified. And one of the biggest complications that we see that, that can cause an operator some regulatory issues is a bit of lethargy being slow to notify the traffic commissioner where there is such material change in for example management and then sort of another one that will always rear its head where there is corporate transactions is financial standing uh, and it's always key that operators just be aware that they do have a requirement to maintain financial standing uh, which is dependent, the level of which is dependent on the number of vehicles that are authorised on their licence. And we've heard about rising costs in the sector. How does that impact on M&A deals, David? Well, I think that the last 12, maybe 18 months have been really tricky in the M&A market in general. Uh, fair few factors at play there, but in difficult markets, we see consolidation um, as an inevitable byproduct. I think the transport industry now for years has, has been going through this consolidation. Um, we anticipate that this will be even more evident over, over the coming quarters. Um, I think companies are essentially just trying to drive um, efficiencies and, and optimize their, their fleet, their their route planning and, and, and drive cost savings wherever they can. But but in haulage and, and transportation, I think you know that's evident in um, fuel purchasing, trying to to get economies of scale really, and and consolidation. You know, joining businesses together can can ultimately um, see economies of scale through maintenance and and all operational expenses that that, that both entities inevitably will incur. Um, as has been mentioned previously, I think you know a low margin industry at, at the best of times. If you can drive efficiencies um, and you know enable multiple companies to compete more effectively, then then consolidation is is arguably a good thing. So, will transport haulage firms be able to secure M and A funding? I think it's more tricky uh, than ever. Certainly, has been over the last twelve months. But when we hone in specifically on the uh, transportation and, and haulage part of the market. Um, they are possibly less impacted. Uh, this is probably due to the such large asset registers that they have as, as businesses. When you look at significant 
vehicles, uh, properties, and, and and overall trade debtors. These businesses do have um, very high asset bases. This, um, when you look at the security that they can offer uh funders is actually leaving them in a, a slightly less impacted position when trying to raise funds for acquisitions so when you look at that part of the sector maybe in comparison to the, the freight forwarding sector where you, you're trying to lend against a, a, a no asset based business um and, and a goodwill and, and relationship driven business rather than a um a, a, an asset uh, reliant sector business uh, it's a little bit more difficult for freight forwarders to raise funding for transactions right now uh, lenders are a little bit more skeptical than ever um, at funding well, the debt markets uh, are certainly not back where they need to be but from a from a transportation perspective um, the abl funders um, do like the security they could they can get uh, against a, a strong asset uh, portfolio Patrick, David, Luke, thank you very much for your insight. If you'd like to contact JMW's commercial road transport team, you can email insideman at jmw.co.uk or call 0161 82 81 999. Please also subscribe to JMW's Inside Man YouTube channel for the latest legal news, hints and tips. I'm Dominic Walker, JMW's Inside Man.